So the uh, talk today, or this morning, um, I will be talking about the overall spectrum of inactivity and activity. What it does for us and what it does to us. And there is obviously a process of going from inactivity to activity as well as activity to inactivity. We have to also consider that the change is not easy. It is very difficult. And if we don't ask those that are trying to support you as being more active, if we as the providers and proponents for that, if we don't consider that this is not an easy process, we've already lost you. We've already lost ourselves if we don't do it ourselves. It's not easy. Barriers and obstacles, hurdles, there's many. And I'm going to touch on a few, but everybody else has their, their own barriers and their own limitations to be able to introduce a more active lifestyle. Optimizing success. I'm going to see if we can kind of hit on some very important aspects of trying to get over some of those hurdles, through those hurdles, and work on the process of you moving through the stages of incorporating more activity and exercise. And then, believe it or not, I'll get to the end, and that's when I talk about more general, but sort of specific, from research, but I'm not going to get too heavy in research today. But I'm going to provide you with a few slides of the bottom line guidelines for exercising in different aspects. So this is a very, I, this is one of my best. This is 1985 in the public health re, um, realm or field of, of investigation. The definition of physical activity is defined as any bodily movement produced by skeletal muscles, muscles that move the skeletal system, that results in energy expenditure. So that right there doesn't say it has to be a strength training exercise, doesn't have to be an aerobic, you know, all running or biking. It's movement. It's movement that is expending some energy. And this energy expenditure can it offer the effects of decreasing the effects of deconditioning and inactivity, as well as could it possibly reverse some of the symptoms that are directly related to MS? And I think that the evidence is growing, it's current and growing in the aspects of it can be beneficial for both of these aspects. So exercise and physical activity, there's a list here, but there's also some other, but these are the four general categories that you can incorporate or get activity out of. One is in leisure recreational activities. This could be something out in the environment. We have a great environment here, out in the mountains, hiking, walking. It could be needlepoint. I don't do needlepoint, but it's an act, you know, it's a leisure recreational activity. But it's movement. If you're moving any part of your body, that is activity. Occupational, if you're still employed or partially employed, just that up and going, getting ready for work, moving, that is considered activity. Activities of daily living, this would be doing your hair, brushing your teeth, getting yourself clothed and unclothed. So those are tech, you know, getting uh, uh, food preparation, those are activities as well. And then we get to the prescribed structured exercise routine. So these are four areas that we should promote more activity to insert that into your day, to have a culmination of activity. But inactivity does a lot to us. So what does inactivity do to us? Um, I'm not sure if this comes across well. Uh, oh my goodness, it's, it's purple. Um, it's not supposed to be purple. Um, but it's very nice for this morning. Um, wow, that's surprising. So uh, local activity without MX. So I'm talking about thresholds today. So inactivity, um, We'll bring you down. Uh, the highest level of functional activity for MS could be at this point. It's going to be less than if you don't have MS. We understand that. Continued inactivity, limited physical activity, might put you to the threshold where you might start to have to utilize an assistive device for ambulation. And further continued inactivity could bring you down to a, a level of threshold of utilizing a wheelchair or a mobilized device. So what can physical activity do for you, or can it do for you? So again, we start with our lowest level of activity. However, can it reverse 
some of this? Can it bring you out of a certain level of disability and continue to? Or as we progress down because of our uh, uh, disease, can it actually halt the progression of a disability related physical inactivity? So can it do those things? It's probable. So my talk is over now and get out and exercise. <laughs> but we all know it's not that easy. So we're asking for, in ourselves, as well as us as providers, we're asking for change. And it's like, well, I am exercising, I'm moving around. We all can move around a little bit more. We all could do a little bit more. I'm working underneath the threshold of my optimal capacity. Everybody is. No one, no one activates themselves as high as they can. We all have our own threshold that we can get a little bit better. So we want to move through a bit more, but there's a change there that has to occur. We have to realize that. So I'm going to pull out from, and I'm not going to get too boring about theories, but this is actually from more theory-based behavioral changes that came from initially in the uh, early 90s, late 80s, of uh, behavioral change for addiction reduction, smoking cessation, and, and recently has been promoted more for, well, what about increasing activity and exercise in any individuals? And more recently, in the last five, 10 years, in particularly persons with MS. So there is a process of change. So we've all heard of um, the fire safety stop, drop, and roll. This is the stop, drop, and roll version of increasing physical activity. So we first have to adopt it, we have to initiate it, and we have to maintain it. So is it a linear process? No. We don't go from, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to do it now. I'm doing it now, I'm going to continue, and I'll never go back. The problem is it's, sick, uh, it's cycling through that process. So there's steps. There's stages. And so let's go through those stages. One is pre-contemplation, contemplation thinking. So there is a stage of, I ain't going to increase my activity. I'm not doing, I'm not going to increase my exercise. I'm not even thinking about it. That's pre-contemplation. Second stage is I'm thinking about it. Someone told me, I read something, I'm thinking about doing it. I'm thinking about doing it in the next six months. Maybe not immediately. Then, preparation. You start to, to, to dabble in a bit more exercise. I asked you to raise your arms up about 10 times. I think some of you did about 30. So you took it that next step. That's fantastic. In a little bit, after I'm done talking, boring you, you almost fall asleep, now you can go have an active break. So now you're going to prepare yourself for action. This is where you're starting to really adapt it. You're starting to exercise more, you're starting to really go through that process. And then maintenance, a much longer, I don't want to advance anything, a much longer step. That wasn't done by accident. We need to maintain it. But again, this doesn't come without barriers. This doesn't come out with, without processes. And it definitely has been proven that the biggest amount of processes that it takes to go from one stage to the next is from pre-contemplation to contemplation. That's definitely been proven. <clears throat> I'm not going to think about it. I'm not, I have no way you know, I'm thinking about it. That's where most of the activity, uh, not physical activity, but your thought process of maybe initiating exercise and activity happens. Least amount of process occurs from action to maintenance. Once you truly get yourself into this realm, a lot less changes, a lot less processing has to go, go on for you to continue it. So barriers, if you can't see it from the back, this is, this is actually a slide that I use for my students too. I teach evidence-based practice for students, and you want to talk about boring lectures about statistics and stuff. <laughs> uh, so I have to lighten it up a bit, and I tell them, yeah, there's barriers to you know, engaging in reading articles and doing statistics and such. So this is a hurdler uh, ready to take off. And that individual is female, she's, she's going to be faced with a lot of barriers. So, so are you. So will you. So have you. 